So welcome everyone to this open group webinar, which today is being brought to us by Avolution Software. And before I hand over to um, Grant Quick uh, from Avolution, our speaker today, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping issues uh, to keep the event moving forward smoothly for everyone. Firstly, with regards to questions, if you'd like to ask a, a question of Grant today, then the best way to do that is to write your question into the text QA facility. If you do write a question in there, can I ask you to address it to all or all participants? That way everyone gets to see all the questions that are being submitted. And our intention is to try and answer as many questions as we can at the end of Grant's presentation today. If you'd like to share a comment uh, with a fellow attendee or even have a, a short conversation with a fellow attendee, then the best way to do that is in the chat facility. So questions in the QA facility uh, and uh, comments in the chat, please. Now, today's event is being recorded, so if you have to leave early or if you experience any local technical difficulties, uh, and I know that sometimes audio can be a little problematical in various parts of the world, then everyone who has uh, registered for today's event will get an email with a URL where they can access today's event recording. So that will probably be out around about uh, midday tomorrow. So Grant, if you're ready, can I ask you to start today's presentation? Absolutely. Thanks very much, Simon. And thanks everyone for coming today. Um, it's great to be hearing from a lot of people and familiar names. Um, my name's Grant Quick. I um, have been with Evolution for a while now, um, but I used to be based in the US, so I see there's a lot of people on the line uh, from there, and I've uh, done a bit of work in the UK as well, so it's great to see you all again. So today I'm going to be talking about data visualization uh, with respect to enterprise architecture and uh, how you can do that uh, when you're a little bit time crunched, as uh, all of us EAs are. But before I get too stuck into the topic, I'll just give you a little bit more background about myself and uh, Avolution, the company that I work for. Uh, so I've been with Avolution for 11 years, um, worn various hats throughout that time. I currently serve as the CTO, and I'm now based in Sydney, Australia. As for a company, um, we were born out of Sydney, Australia, uh, but we do cover the globe now. Uh, we cover over 100 different countries, about 2,000 different clients that we support. We have six global offices, I work with many different partners, and we are one of the uh, industry leading tools as rated by uh, Gartner and Forrester, including Gartner's peer insight reviews, which are uh, submitted by end users. Um, as a company, we've been going for 17 years now. Uh, we've long been supporters of the open group, so no doubt you've seen us at various events over the years, and I'm sure you'll see us again soon. So as for what we're going through today, we'll be looking at exactly what data visualization is and why we need it. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the best practices for using data visualization. And uh, part of that I'll be doing by going through a hall of shame uh, to show you some bad examples. I think uh, examples are a great way of illustrating uh, what are some of the good and bad practices and uh, that helps to give a feel for uh, the best way to go about doing data viz, um, followed by a hall of fame to show you the good examples. Uh, we'll also cover some tips and tricks for things that you can do to uh, squeeze a little bit of extra value out of your data visualization. And uh, we'll also be looking at how you can use them in dashboards, uh, which is becoming a very popular topic now. And of course, finally, at the end, there'll be any questions. So please do pop them into uh, the Q&A facility, and we'll be happy to uh, address those uh, towards the end of the session today. So before we get stuck in too far with how to do data visualization, first of all, what is it? And uh, I'd like to call myself the godfather of data visualization, but unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, that honor goes to Stephen Few, who's a bit of a legend in the industry. Um, and the way that he defines data viz is that it is the graphical display of abstract information for two purposes, sense making, also called data analysis, and communication. So I think that distinction is very important, especially for uh, enterprise architects. Uh, as enterprise architects, we do produce a lot of different artifacts, and ultimately, we do need to look at those artifacts from two perspectives. A lot of times we make things internally for the EA team, 
to help us analyse what we're doing and try and derive insights from the massive data that we have. Uh, but then also we need to be able to communicate the results of that analysis out to various stakeholders. And so using data visualisation is a great way of being able to do that. Uh, but do keep in mind those two different outlets for it and uh, we will be looking at those as we go through some of the examples today. So why is it that we need data visualisation? Before we had data visualisation, it's actually a relatively new science. It's been around for a little bit over 200 years. And prior to that, all information was basically presented through uh, tables and tabular formats like the one that you see there. And so if we consider that table, it's basically a table of different services uh, that we have. There's uh, various years that we have across the top of that table. And it's a matrix format, so you can see in the cells that it's showing uh, some kind of total cost figure for each of those services over those five years. Now, having the data in that format is very useful. It's easy to be able to look up certain values. So you might look, for example, at service three in year one, how much is that going to cost us? You can very quickly reference that and then compare that to year five and see there's a difference there. But it does have its limitations. Uh, it's very difficult to see trends without spending a fair bit of time studying the information that's there. It's also difficult to compare two side by side without having to go back and forth a lot. Um, so you've got all the information there that you need to tell a story, but it's not necessarily the most effective way of telling that story. Now, a lot of um, enterprise architecture practices, um, the first thing they'll think of when they're um, starting to uh, show information visually is uh, using things like Visio. And so they'll put together some box and line diagrams. And then when they want to start looking at cost, they might start annotating that diagram with text, or they might do it using color as been shown here in this example. Uh, but as you can see, it is a little bit limited. I can see some useful things there. So um, firstly, it's a little bit hard to identify what's what. Uh, there's no legend there. Um, but the background color is showing the year one cost from that table. So I can see that service two, because it's red, has a much higher um, year one cost than some of the others. I can see that that cost is descending because some of those markers uh, that are on the right hand side of that shape are going to yellow. Uh, but ultimately it's very difficult to compare the, the five that are there uh, beyond doing direct comparison between any two. Uh, so it's not really much more useful, if any more useful at all, than the original table that we looked at. If we start to look at a data visualization technique on the other hand, uh, this one is using a line chart. And you'll see that it starts to tell us a whole lot of information that uh, wasn't apparent initially. So firstly, we can see all the trends of the services. Each of the lines represents a different service. Our orange one service two is generally the highest cost service that we have there, but it is a descending cost. Our lowest is service four at the bottom, and it's a pretty insignificant cost compared to the others. Something else that's really interesting is the gray one, service three. It has a bit of an outlier in its data. If you have a look at year one, two, four, and five, it's very linear. But year three, there's a bit of a dip there. So it's very easy to see that there might have been a data entry error there. You might have seen that in the table, but probably less of a chance for us. It's pretty hard to miss here. So being able to present information in this way can be done relatively quickly. And it helps us a lot to get our message out. Uh, so we can save time with communicating to various stakeholders. Uh, and in our analysis, we can also find things that potentially might come back to bite us later if we don't fix them up sooner. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can uh, present data visually. Uh, some work was done in the 1980s on human perception and the easiest ways to understand how data is presented visually. Um, this was broken down into different categories which we've got summarized here. Uh, so have a look at this and just quietly think to yourselves about what you think might be the easiest thing to interpret. Uh, 
and think about what are some of the visuals that you might already use currently uh, or frequently uh, to gather some information and communicate it across. Uh, so one of the most common things we often see are pie charts, and so that's what we're showing there at the top um, left. Uh, pie charts use angle to show magnitude, uh, but you might also do it using uh, different uh, scales that you have and maybe just plotting dots on those scales so you can represent the magnitude with the position of the dot. Maybe you use color to do it, similar to that heat map that we just looked at, or there might be something using area or volume. So I'm sure you've seen these kinds of things, even Excel supports a lot of these. And you'll see them in all kinds of reports. But um, the work in the 1980s actually focused on which things were the easiest to digest. And uh, Cleveland and McGill uh, were the two who put together some of the seminal works on that. Um, so if you have a look at what is easiest for the human brain to interpret, um, it generally falls uh, to a position that's along a common scale. So if you have multiple values, they would use the same scale. Obviously, that's not always possible, so sometimes you have to use different scales on the one chart. And that's perfectly valid, but it is a little bit more difficult to be able to interpret that. Or if you have the scales separate so that they're in separate charts uh, rather than overlapping, that's something that might be more difficult to interpret. Going beyond that, and these next three things, length, direction, and angle, are in order, so length is easier to determine than angle. Uh, but these three things come next in the hierarchy. So these are probably the most common things that you see in data visualization, uh, at least amongst uh, enterprise architects. Following that, we have area, and then we go to volume and curvature. And at the very bottom is shading and color saturation. So if you have been restricted to using heat maps, um, that's something to consider. There may be easier ways to get your point across and ways that can be interpreted much quicker. Now, the kinds of charts that we'll look at today, they don't always fit nicely into one of these uh, particular um, categories. These were focused purely on the primitives behind each of the different types of charts. Um, so as an example of that, uh, you might look at a bar chart. A bar chart might involve color, so in that case, it's looking at length of the bar uh, down at number three, and it's also using color at the very bottom. If it starts at the origin zero, you could argue that it's actually showing position along a common scale. Uh, so as you can see, there's many ways that you could dice it up. You might even involve area if you make it a 3D bar chart. So even if you are just using a particular type of chart, uh, you can think about how you might be able to simplify that uh, by coming back to this kind of uh, taxonomy. So I'll get now to the Hall of Shame. I think it's easiest to start with uh, bad examples and things we can all relate to. I'm sure you've all seen uh, different charts in newspapers and so forth that uh, often weren't the easiest things to interpret. Apologies to Jackie Chan for that graphic. So number one that we have are uh, percentage charts that don't add up to 100%. And I really like this example that was from the uh, 2012 presidential um, primaries in America. Um, so if I look at that, it's showing three different Republican candidates. If I add up the percentages, we get 193. So just taking that on face value, I could probably conclude that 193% of Americans supported a Republican candidate uh, back in 2012. So it's kind of a surprise that a Republican didn't get elected. Um, so you might think that maybe that was just bad data, but it's not bad data. Um, it's actually um, perfectly valid because uh, certain individuals might back multiple candidates and who they support. Uh, this isn't a, uh, an indication of who they voted for, rather just who they had support for. And so if you were to show that as a bar chart, that's something that would be perfectly valid. You'd be able to see who had the most support. Uh, but you wouldn't have to worry about the, uh, which things are exclusive and so forth. If we have a pie chart, it is showing that uh, we're uh, looking at pieces of the whole. The whole is 
So if it doesn't add up to that, then it's really not a valid chart. Pie charts aren't the only percentage charts. Uh, you can use things like um, stacked bar charts that add up to 100%. Um, so you'll often see those showing similar things as well. Um, ultimately, if something's supposed to add up to 100, then make sure it does before you publish it. The example on the left there, uh, very similar. Uh, the one on the right's a little bit different. So it's showing um, a percentage of um, who supports something versus not. And um, we've got in the a larger um, piece there, the no vote. And if you have a look very carefully, you'll notice that 49% voted no, 50% voted yes. So firstly, we haven't got 100%. Uh, but secondly, the no wedge is much bigger than the yes wedge, which is very misleading. So always make sure that uh, when you're using a chart, um, not only is the data valid, uh, but the visual actually supports the data. In this case, we could probably just use a table and show that 50% were yes and 49% were no, or rather 50% were no. Maybe we'd show our percentage points so it's a little bit more accurate. Um, but ultimately, the visual here doesn't really help us in any way. It just adds confusion. Probably the second most common problem we see are uh, too many data points being shown. And uh, ultimately, if you try to communicate too much information, uh, you don't really have a story to be able to tell anyone. Um, I've studied the chart on the left for quite a while. Uh, it's to do with ice hockey and uh, scoring percentages and things like that. Uh, beyond that, I haven't really learned anything from that chart. I can't tell you what any of the mess in the middle means. I can see a few of the, uh, the notations around the edge, uh, but it still doesn't really mean anything to me. So. Ultimately, if I can't figure it out, it's probably not an effective communication tool. On the right, we have one that's more EA specific. We're looking at the cost of servers. Cost is something that we often want to look at in enterprise architecture. Uh, cost modeling is a great way of being able to um, show the value of EA early. If you can get some cost figures and start to attribute them to different areas. Now, there is some useful information here. I can see that there are some servers that are significantly uh, higher cost than the others, but that does get drowned out by the number of wedges that are there. Also, it's very hard to see which servers are which. Um, having a chart that has a legend next to it has the downside of making you look in two places to figure out what's what. And you can see here that uh, because we've got so many wedges, colors get repeated. So it's actually pretty hard to tell what's what. I could find a blue label, but it's not necessarily going to represent that big blue wedge that we have there. Now, I'm not a big fan of pie charts, and most people that uh, are into data visualization usually aren't. Um, but if you want to make a pie chart really bad, I would say the best way to do it is to turn it into a 3D pie chart. Uh, they do look fancy. Uh, they also look a little bit like uh, Excel 97, which was probably when they were most popular. Uh, but ultimately, they just make it very difficult to interpret the pie chart. If you have a look at this particular one, it's also showing server cost. Um, it's a little bit better than the last graphic in that it's not showing all the small wedges, it's just focusing on the significant ones. But if we look at the bottom left quadrant, you can see three wedges there. See if you can figure out which of those wedges is the biggest. So it's actually the purple wedge that looks the biggest to me, but in actual fact, the three wedges that are there are exactly the same size. Uh, because you've uh, basically put the angle on an angle, and it's the angle that we have to interpret, it makes it very difficult for the human brain to perceive exactly what the angle is. Angle in itself is difficult to determine, as we saw from the hierarchy before. So showing that in a bar chart or a dot plot is more than possible. It would make it very easy to see what the values are, and we wouldn't have all these issues that are presented with this particular chart. Number four, we finally got to something that uh, we can easily see the magnitude with. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what that magnitude is because there's no axis on this particular chart. We can see four different strategies. What we're measuring exactly, I don't know because we don't have the scale there. And we also don't have a title to indicate what it is. 
but that happens way too often I'm afraid. Every chart that we have should tell a story. If we don't provide the context in which to interpret it, then ultimately it's not going to make sense to anybody. If we look quickly at this one, we can see application reliability, and there's two applications here. It appears that application one at the bottom is much more reliable than application two. But if you start to study the chart a little bit more, you'll see that's probably not quite true. Uh, we've got 95% as the reliability for application one and 94 for application two. So that's not a very significant difference. That could really be down to standard error. And the issue that we're seeing here is that the bar chart doesn't start at the origin. Uh, typically bar charts, unless they're showing multiple values and uh, they're showing the difference between those values, should always start at the origin, or zero. And if they don't, it's very easy to um, portray something that isn't quite true. And sometimes that's done on purpose. Uh, it's not a very altruistic thing to do that, so I wouldn't recommend it anyway. Uh, but certainly do avoid that uh, because it can be very uh, misleading. Now I talked about a dislike for 3D charts before with pie charts. Um, with column charts or bar charts, it's even more of an issue, I believe. Uh, if we look at these examples here, uh, you can see there's actually data that we can't even see because it's hidden by other uh, columns that are in the chart. So that automatically is a big no. Um, putting it into 3D also makes it very difficult to compare um, the values on the Z or Z axis. Um, so if we look at our uh, server cost on the one on the left, AUDCO3, the server that's at the far right, I can't really tell whether the cost is going up or going down on the, um, the far side. Um, probably I could pick two people in the audience and uh, each would give me a different answer. So ultimately, if it's not going to be clear, then it's not effective for communicating. The one to the right uh, is probably an even worse example of uh, a 3D uh, column chart, uh, made worse, I think, by the fancy bananas that are there. Oftentimes, people get cute with graphics and it doesn't always help to communicate what we need to do. And that brings me to the next one, which is getting too cute with graphics. And there's another example of that here. If we look here, it looks like uh, the Golden Arches uh, has the highest sales by quite a significant portion, and it's at 41 billion. If we look at the next highest um, fast food restaurant there, it's Burger King at 11.3. Now that's not too shabby. It's more than a quarter of the sales of McDonald's. Um, but that's because uh, the way that we're looking at this chart, um, because width has been incorporated into it, uh, we just automatically assume that that's part of what's being shown. But actually it's the height of the logo that matters. The width isn't supposed to be factored in at all. But because the area of the Golden Arches is about 16 times larger than the Burger King logo, it makes us think that the actual uh, sales are going to be much higher and more significant than they really are. So the bottom line there is you can use graphics, but just be very careful and make sure they don't detract from the underlying message. Now, uh, line charts are something I'm a big fan of. Uh, they do involve angle, not always the easiest thing to interpret, or rather direction. Um, but in some cases, it's the easiest way to see trends. Uh, in this case, we have um, processes which aren't necessarily related. Uh, they are discrete. And uh, the line that we have there kind of implies that they might be related. It also makes it very difficult to see the actual value. Uh, we've also curved this line. So for process seven in the middle there, it's very difficult to see is the value exactly one, or is it maybe you know, some uh, decimal place that's near one. It's then difficult to compare that to process 10, which is at one. Um, so there's a lot of things that might be construed from here that aren't exactly true. So be careful about using lines where there isn't a relationship between elements. That then brings us to the Hall of Fame. And uh, on the more positive side, we could look at the same data that we just had. But here it's presented much more clearly. We can see that there's no relationship between the processes. Uh, we can see exactly what the processing time is. We can see at the bottom there, there's four different processes that take one hour. And so there's no mistaking exactly what the values are and how they compare. 
same thing could be done with a dot plot uh, to make it clear that uh, it's the position that matters. But ultimately, that's a very effective way of showing that kind of data. Now, this particular example here comes from uh, William Playfair. He was actually the inventor of the line chart, and that was in the late 1700s. He was a Scottish gentleman, and he worked in um, political uh, analysis and um, various areas related to that. And so he invented a lot of different charts. He also invented the pie chart, and uh, I try not to hold that against him because he did a lot more bad than good. Uh, but if we have a look at this one, I think it's a fantastic graphic. It tells a really good story. Uh, because he was involved in uh, politics, something that he did want to communicate at the time was the amount of debt that was being accumulated by uh, Great Britain going to war. It's a little bit hard to read the labels here. We don't use these kind of fonts now. Um, but you can see here in the middle that the Spanish War uh, began in 1789. And following that, you can see there was a rise in national debt, which then ended and reverted back after the war had finished. Then the Continental War began, and the debt went very steeply up until that war ended. And it started to recede again. And then we had the American Revolution War. And that once again caused debt to go up greatly. So the point that he was making was that Great Britain had to be very careful about going to war. Uh, because it wasn't just about patriotism, there was a cost that was being incurred, and that was something that he felt needed to be uh, considered. And so ultimately, this was a very effective way of uh, being able to communicate that. He could have just shown a table, uh, but most people would have looked at a few of the numbers and not really understood the full impact of what was being um, demonstrated. Something that I'm personally a very huge fan of um, is bubble charts. Bubble charts allow you to show three or more measures um, in the one chart in a very concise way. And two of those measures use position. So the X and the Y axis are things that you should be using uh, to show the most significant measures. Uh, ultimately, that should be the focus of the chart. But if you do have supplementary measures that you'd like to show, you can show those with the size of the bubble, uh, the color of the bubble, you can also use the border of the bubble and uh, even the shape potentially. Um, but ultimately, do keep it simple. Don't show more than you need to. But when you do need to show more than two things, this is a fantastic way of being able to do that, which is relatively easy to interpret. Something else you can do with charts, which is very new in the data viz world, is to make them interactive. This is something that uh, barely existed 10 years ago, but now with uh, BI tools and tools like Abacus, uh, you're seeing it a lot more frequently. Uh, this is a really good example that we're showing here because it is a tree map. A tree map shows area, and uh, I think a flat tree map by itself, personally, is not a very effective way of um, showing information. You can produce them in Excel, uh, but ultimately, because they are showing area, they're not the most intuitive thing to interpret. However, when you start to make them interactive and you can drill down into different areas, I think it changes the ball game entirely. Um, here we're drilling in uh, to our architecture, to applications. Uh, we can see how those applications fall into different areas and then uh, the actual cost of those applications. So there's a huge amount of data that's being presented here. There's actually thousands of elements. If we wanted to show that using a dot plot or a bar chart, We'd need a huge screen to be able to do that. We'd probably have to print out many, many pages. Um, and so having that as an interactive visualization instead works really well. And with the tree map, it does make a really good use of the real estate that you have on the screen. It fills up the entire screen as opposed to something that's circular or leave a border around the edge that's unused space. So this is something that I recommend quite a lot, especially when you have a hierarchical model. Uh, the best way to explore that is, um, or to um, make the best use of that, is to uh, make that interactive. Now, petition maps are another thing that I'm a big fan of, um, very similar to um, tree maps, but they show the entire hierarchy all at once. So once again, they're best shown in an inter interactive view. Um, you can have tree maps, or rather uh, petition maps, that you can drill down into various areas. 
So you can show it all at once, or you can start to progress down and see things in more detail. Uh, they're also known as icicle charts, but only if they're vertically oriented, so like icicles hanging off the ceiling. Uh, but they work very effectively as well. You can use those to show cost, uh, just like you can with tree maps. And they tend to resonate very well with uh, various stakeholders we've found in our experience. Something that um, you don't see very often, um, starting to pop up a little bit more, are Senki diagrams or Senki charts. And they're really good for showing flow of information. So they can show the magnitude of information that's flowing into a certain area and how much is flowing out. In this particular case, we're looking at an application and most of the cost in the application is inherent in itself. Uh, but some of the cost comes from other areas we can see on the left there. And then we can also see that the cost of that application gets attributed to different business areas that consume it. So when you're building cost models, that's a really good way of being able to show how those flows come in and out. Of course, connectedness is one of the big things with enterprise architecture, which is different from a lot of other areas. Um, most practices that are looking uh, at IT from different perspectives are focused on one area. Um, so they don't necessarily consider connections to other parts of the organization. And so with EA, we do need to focus a lot more on connections. And there's a lot less science to showing connections. Uh, but graph theory is something that's becoming more common. Um, there's uh, very few tools that are built on graph databases, but uh, Abacus is one of them. So uh, we have quite a bit of experience with that. Um, and showing a graph using a knowledge graph uh, in particular is a great way of showing that. Uh, you can show the connections and you can use sizing and various things to show the nodes as well. And so that's a really good way of showing complex structures that you have. If you have quite a lot to show, uh, you can fill up a page pretty quickly. Uh, so one way that we've developed to work around that is to use uh, 3D uh, knowledge graphs. And so uh, you can basically navigate through those like you would a flight simulator or some kind of gaming experience um, so that you can see thousands upon thousands of different nodes and uh, how they relate to other areas all in the one place. And uh, once you've done that, you might then look at constraining your data uh, to a 2D view. But it's a great place to start when you do have that large volume that you need to get to grips with. Now, road mapping uh, is a very common topic uh, that we've covered in other webinars. So if you haven't seen those, uh, please do have a look through some of the previous recordings in the open group. Uh, but we certainly have a view of uh, road mapping and the kinds of things it should encompass. We talk about different kinds of road maps. And there's no reason you can't use data viz to communicate what you have in your road maps. So we talk about type one road maps, which talk about what the recommendations are that you're going to be making. You might show that using a um, bubble chart like the example we have here. The type two roadmap then looks at uh, some of the, uh, the dates when things are taking place, when a change is going to be happening. A life cycle chart might be one way that you show that. You might then also look at um, how things are being impacted. What are the ripples as you change times for certain components? Uh, what's the chain reaction effect that uh, takes place? Are there other dates that automatically get adjusted as a result of that? And you can show that using knowledge graphs as well. So lots of different views you can use for roadmaps. So be mindful of the kind of techniques that you have available to you there. Finally, to wrap up the Hall of Fame, you don't necessarily have to use data visualization. So don't forget that tables are available to you. And sometimes the table is the best way of showing things. You can incorporate some of the data viz elements, such as um, color for heat mapping, or you might have some kind of indicator to indicate things are going up or down. Uh, but in this particular example, we're looking at a risk register. We could show that with lots of different graphs. We could show how many get prioritized as high, medium versus low, how many are being mitigated. Uh, but ultimately, if you're a risk manager, um, you're probably going to want to see this view more than anything. And you'll be familiar with this. This is what you'll be used to interpreting. So this is ultimately the best view for that particular audience. 
All right, so we've got a few minutes to go. I just wanted to cover a few other tips and tricks um, to help you out along the way with making the most of DataViz. And I'll start with color. Color is something that I would advise uh, to use sparingly. Uh, um, oftentimes we'll see a lot of tables that get colored in every cell and it just gets a little bit overwhelming and tiring. And so ultimately when you do use color, you wanna make sure that it draws the audience in and uh, is used effectively. One of the biggest pitfalls we see is um, in most cultures, green represents a positive thing and red, not such a good thing. So a high cost might be red, a low cost might be green. Um, however, we often see people that violate that rule and they'll use just whichever colors they have available to them quickly. And ultimately, when they present that information to people, uh, it doesn't always give the right indication of what they're trying to say. So just be very careful about those kinds of things. And colors do vary by culture. In some cultures, yellow represents something as being cheap. In other cultures, yellow or gold can represent something being very valuable. So just be very mindful of that and your audience. Also think about the color schemes that you use in your organization. Um, some of your um, tables, for example, might look good if you give them more of a corporate color scheme um, so that they uh, fit in with other documents that you might have. Also, uh, just be careful about how bright you make the colors. If you want to draw attention to certain things, you can certainly make them very bright, but do that extremely sparingly. Most colors should be more um, muted or uh, pastel shades. It also works very effectively to uh, put similar hues together as we've got here. There's a green column, there's a purple column and so forth. Uh, we do have a lot more tips on that. Uh, there's a link there at the bottom. So if that's something of interest, uh, please do visit that and um, have a look there. Now, of course, uh, enterprise architects being time poor, uh, need to make sure that they can uh, get their data very quickly and start to build analysis around it. Um, so some of the tips that we'd make there are to uh, aim for what we call snackable data, things that you can bite off quickly. So your analysis doesn't have to be perfect. As we saw with the very first example we had today, uh, sometimes doing data viz helps you to identify outliers. So you can identify bad data uh, by doing your analysis. Uh, before you wait until you've got all of your data massaged and perfect. Uh, you can also start to communicate it with different audiences uh, so that they can um, understand what it is and they can provide feedback as to whether they're understanding that or whether they'd prefer other formats. That way you can make sure you improve things gradually over time and set expectations accordingly. And um, make sure that you do involve the stakeholders as much as possible because ultimately, if they're not involved, um, they're going to be less likely to contribute data and um, make sure that your practice is successful. Finally, I'd just like to cover uh, dashboards quickly. So uh, dashboarding is something that we hear a lot about and it's something that we support. So uh, we work with a lot of clients in that area and we ultimately see there being three key kinds of dashboards to consider. The first is more your executive dashboard. Um, so these are more of your high level KPIs and metrics that you want to communicate. Uh, they're things that will often be shown at meetings. They're not things that change very often, so people won't be checking them on a daily basis. Uh, so typically you want to keep them pretty simple, easy to interpret, and um, show just some of the higher level entities that you might be capturing. Secondly, uh, you'll be looking at dashboards that are more targeted towards the EA team typically themselves and other stakeholders that might be interested in performing analysis. So they're a lot more detailed. Uh, typically you want them to be very interactive so you can drill in and look at certain areas that are of interest in more detail. Uh, think about how they can be filtered down so that you can um, look at certain areas as you start to analyze those in more detail. And then finally, we look at operational dashboards. And these are dashboards that help users that are contributing data um, to your practice. So they may not be part of the EA team, there might be other stakeholders that have some other interests, but they have useful information to communicate back. What's really important with these dashboards is the ability to be able to edit information. And so a lot of dashboarding tools don't support that. 
that's something that we see as being really key to operational success. Uh, being able to not only edit the data that's there, but be able to see the data that other users are editing. So you can do that in real time, understand exactly what's happening, uh, be able to make sure that things are kept current, and ultimately reflect that in some of your visualizations so people don't have to wait days or weeks uh, to be able to see what's of interest to them. Okay, so uh, that wraps up the presentation for today. I've put a few takeaways there. I won't read through them, but it's basically the things that we've gone through. But I'll leave that up there while we go through the Q&A. Um, so Simon, have uh, you been monitoring that? Have there been some questions coming through? Yeah, we've got a couple. Thanks for that, uh, Grant. I think it's really helpful when we focus in on uh, a practical element of EA. So I think that's what you've done today. So ex excellent. Thank you very much for that. We haven't got a lot of questions yet, but we've, we've got a couple that's coming, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, one from Dennis, and this reflects some of the other comments. He's asking, are there any tips for developing visual diagrams with color blindness as a consideration? Yes, yeah, that's an excellent question, Dennis. Um, I actually did work with a client once that had that exact um, situation. So one of their key users was color blind. Um, as you probably know, there are different kinds of color blindness. Um, the most two common kinds are green gray and green red, if I remember. Um, so in my particular case, it was green gray color blindness. Um, there are other kinds of color blindness as well, but they're less common. Uh, but ultimately, if that is something um, that certain stakeholders um, are affected by, then you do need to take that into account, especially if you're looking at a green to red scale in your charts to show good versus bad. Um, obviously, that definition is going to get lost very quickly if the users can't differentiate between those two. Um, so think about other ways you can do it. If you use the one color hue for something, um, then which colors you use are less important. It's more the saturation of the color um, that the users will be able to interpret. And that goes for any diagrams in enterprise architecture as well. So it's a really good consideration to keep in mind. Also the use of fonts and how they mix with colors, um, something very key as well. That's great. Thank you, Grant. We've had a couple of people asking about copies of today's presentation. Um, how do you want to play that this time, Grant? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to give you the slides, uh, Simon, if it's easiest for you to distribute them. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. fantastic. Cool. So if, yeah, if anyone needs a copy of uh, Grant's presentation, then you'll all have my email address. Please email me and I'll make sure that uh, I help everyone with that. Grant, we've got a couple of other questions coming in here from Frederick. Uh, while data visualizations can be generated in real time, they do not provide any explanations. And he's asking a specific question about Abacus here. He says, does Abacus able you to use natural language generation to write narrative? Uh, yes, so the short answer is yes. Um, ultimately, it does come down to the design of the visualization. So most tools will let you design some kind of chart, um, let's say a bar chart. Uh, but ultimately, it's usually down to the user to make sure that they're putting in the information that gives it context. Um, so as an example of that, um, in our tool Abacus, uh, when you generate a chart, um, it has a default heading. Um, that heading is not descriptive. So we recommend changing it to make it descriptive to basically give you the context you need to interpret that diagram um, or chart. Ultimately, any visualization that you present should be able to stand on its own to be interpreted. If you need to provide um, some kind of cue outside of the diagram or chart, uh, then it's probably not a successful chart. Uh, so you can certainly include uh, verbiage on the chart um, to help you do that. Uh, but it depends on the chart as to where you'll do that and um, how you'll do it. Uh, but ultimately, yes, Abacus does have that capability. Okay, thank you. Andrew says, he says, you just noticed the ability to embed in MS Teams. He says, how does that work and how are people typically using that? Yeah, good question. Um, so that was actually a point on the slide I forgot to mention. Um, but we've been working a lot with uh, Microsoft Teams. We use it internally, uh, but we also allow users to embed uh, their dashboards in Microsoft Teams. 
Uh, very useful. Firstly, um, having single sign-on um, with our dashboards allows us to embed it in so people can just access it through Teams without having to provide any kind of login. Um, the other thing too is that they don't need to go hunting for what they're looking for. You can present it um, in certain channels. Uh, people will see them appear in those channels. They won't necessarily know where that data came from. They'll just know what the data is and that it's pertinent to them. And if you need them to update that data, then that's a great way of um, getting them involved in the process. Okay, another uh, uh, abacus question here. This is from Will. Can the software support input of diagrams that are Archimate based from other software tools and interpret the data? Yeah, good question, Will. Um, so we can, um, as you might be aware, Archimate has an XML interchange format uh, that's supported in Archimate 2.1 and Archimate 3.0. So we support both of those. Um, if you do have another tool that can export to those, then we can bring that into Abacus. Excellent. And one final question. Sorry, this is uh, once again about Abacus. Uh, can Abacus help build the ontology of an enterprise or, it, or is it used to just visualize the ontology? Yeah, good question. Abacus allows you to build the ontology as well. Um, so very commonly organizations start with capabilities. Um, they'll often use a pre-canned capability model uh, depending on their industry vertical. Um, so for example, transient industry might use something like TAP, banking might use BN. Um, once you've got uh, that, you then might modify it or you might build your own from scratch. Uh, then you can link that to other areas within your um, organization, in your model, and then you can build those things into visualizations and start to understand how they all hang together. Uh, but yes, with Abacus, you do have complete control over all of that. That's great. Well, we've come to the end of the questions, Grant, so I think this is probably a good time to uh, end today's presentation. Is there any final comment you'd like to make before I do so? Yeah, just quickly, I'll just mention that our new version of Abacus is about to be released, and we do have a preview webinar coming up on the 7th of November. So if that's of interest to anyone, uh, please just visit our website and you'll find the details for registering for that. Um, also, uh, just quickly, uh, my details up there if you'd like to get in touch, as well as our website address. Thanks very much for attending today. Really appreciate you uh, coming around, especially for those who it's not a uh, comfortable time zone for. Uh, but I enjoyed presenting, so uh, hopefully we'll get the chance to uh, do it again soon. So that's great. And obviously, Grant, we know it's, um, as you say, an uncomfortable time at your end. So we thank you for your time today. Thanks, Simon. And thanks, everyone. We'll talk yep. soon. Thanks, everyone. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.